You're listening to New England Real Estate Journal Radio with Rick Kaplan, New England source for commercial real estate news. This is New England Real Estate Journal Radio on the Money Matters Radio Network and online at moneymattersboston.com. Welcome to the New England Real Estate Journal Radio Show. I'm Rick Kaplan with Eric Wilson, and we're here today at the HELP Conference at the Seaport in Boston. And like always, this is our, what? Third year. Third? Yeah, third year. Yeah, every year we come here, we meet all the important people of the hotel industry, or right. hospitality industry, I should say. It's okay. And we're here again. We are here again. Exciting. As you can hear from behind, it's packed again, as uh, always. And we're looking forward to uh, the talk about the Olympics. I know they're going to bring that up in about a half hour. Um, every year it's a huge turnout, and we get to meet a lot of great people in the hotel industry. Yeah, right now they're all in seminars, uh, conferences. I some of say. them are. Yeah, some of them are. <laughs> some of them are out here. They're some are networking. Yeah, having some conversations. But uh, we are going to talk about the Olympics yes. of 2024, hopefully coming to Boston. You know, we have had these conversations. We have been. In it's the studio, been, yeah. and uh, they can be interesting. <laughs> yeah, it's but. been going on now for like the last month, you know, ever since they brought it up and what we thought, and we put a bit out there, so... It's exciting stuff, and it's a good conversation for Boston to have. You know, can we do it? Should yeah. we do it? I think we'll uh, have an interesting uh, interview. We will. And some of the other people that are speaking as well. Yes, we'll yeah. have a few. Uh, I mean, they're talking about all the, you know, the big things in the industry. One is uh, how TripAdvisor is changing. You know, people are basing uh, how they buy hotels on what their reviews are on how their customer service is toward. Right, uh, it's almost like a uh, employer right. looking in at your Facebook or your LinkedIn account to see what kind of uh, acti activities you're on. Right, with. right. And that it's actually a good way of finding out whether you're getting into a good hotel or you're getting into a bad hotel right. investment. Or how well, how well the management is that's already in place in case you want to retain them or things like that. Exactly. It's, uh, right. Yeah, who would have thought, you know, the internet changing the way we and do business. Social media. <laughs> and social media social as media. well. Social media is changing the way you buy, you yeah. purchase hotels. It definitely is. I mean, everyone I know, I mean, you go to Google and the first thing comes up is usually I know every hotel I, uh, I buy. Yeah. I go through all social media. <laughs> yeah. Every hotel and what you're about to purchase is, yeah, I'm going to take out TripAdvisor to make sure right. this is the right purchase for me and Rick. But I'd like to thank our sponsors. As always. As always. Comstack, Video Doorman, City of Marlboro, Mass., City of Rochester, New Hampshire, City of Hartford, Connecticut, and City of Warwick, Rhode Island. We also have some events that are coming up. First one we can't forget is April 23rd. We have uh, cocktails and conversations of northern New England at, in Portsmouth. Yep. Uh, that is uh, 530 to 9 at the, uh, I think it's called the Harborside. Harborside the Conference. Conference uh, Center. Event Center. Yeah. Uh, also, we have in June, Connecticut uh, Business Expo 2015 put right. on by the Connecticut uh, Business Journal. Uh, that will be, uh, like I said, June 4th. Uh, then we have the NBA, NEBFM 2015 at the Boston Convention Center, June 17th and 18th. Mm -hmm. And now we have NERJ's Cocktails and Conversations in Rhode Island at the Crown Plaza Providence Warwick Hotel. And that is June 24th. So look forward to Save that the one. date. Up. Save the date on that one. And we'll be right back on Money Matters Radio Network. The next level in commercial real estate. This is New England Real Estate Radio on the Money Matters Radio Network and online at moneymattersboston.com. Commercial real estate can be a risky endeavor if you don't have all the information you need to make an educated decision. Why spend time digging for data when CompStack provides investors, lenders, and landlords accurate lease comps for office, industrial, and retail properties, starting rents, concessions, and more in just a few clicks. The world's largest investors and lenders use CompStack to benchmark their properties and underwrite their deals. Shouldn't you? CompStack. Better data, better deals. Visit GetLeaseComps.com today. Rick Kaplan on the Money Matters Radio Network and online at MoneyMattersBoston.com. We're back on New England Real Estate Journal Radio. I'm Rick Kaplan with Eric Wilson, and we have sitting with us, with us is Tim Egger of Hotel Investor. <laughs> nice and, work. Uh, 
and, and Tim's company is involved in crowdfunding. Yes, uh, we are. Uh, so I think it's important to note, though, as opposed to uh, like a Kickstarter or Indiegogo, uh, where you have either a, a charitable uh, donation or a rewards-based donation uh, for their projects, uh, we actually uh, do equity crowdfunding for debt and equi uh, equity for uh, hotel projects nationwide. But at the end of the day, when you invest in these, you're an actual owner of the property or the debt instrument, and you actually get a return on your investment, which is, is a little more uh, up to par. Yeah, exactly. And how so, long has this platform been available? Uh, our platform's been up for about six months, so okay. it's, it's definitely new. Uh, we're utilizing the new uh, exemption to the Securities Act that was created by Title II of the Jobs Act. Uh, so the exemption's only been legal for about a year and a half. Mm -hmm. um, and again, our, our platform's been up for uh, six months. Now, what makes your crowdfunding different from other crowdfunding that's out there? Okay. Well, again, even among the equity crowdfunding sites, um, what you do have here, when the, the law was passed, uh, a lot of what we call the early adopters that came into the space were more tech-oriented. Uh, and, and came in and wrote the, the SEC required uh, code programming mm -hmm. for this. Um, but they didn't really have any real estate background at, at, at all. So what you've seen is that there's a number of firms uh, that, that do what we call white labeling, which is essentially they, they don't curate the offerings. They don't say whether the offering's good or bad, uh, just that the numbers add up and, and kind of buyer beware. Whereas uh, I've been in the hotel business since 1991. Um, I started in operations, uh, was selling hotel properties uh, for the last 19 years, and we underwrite and vet every single offering. Um, you know, and we put our reputation and our you know knowledge of hotels uh, on the line with each each offering. So basically, you have people in your operation that are from the industry. <laughs> Correct. So they know exactly what's going on and they know what their clients are all about. And this uh, platform is spe uh, specifically geared toward the hotel industry. A absolutely, 100%. Um, we were somewhat uh, uh, amazed, actually. Uh, not only were we the first, and I believe still the only hotel-specific platform, uh, we're actually the only uh, product type of specific commercial real estate product type platform, which I think is going to change. Mm -hmm. Because again, as opposed to these early adopters that were more tech oriented, there's more people like myself that actually have real estate background that are coming into the space. And uh, I, I think that you're going to see, you know, certainly an apartment uh, specific platform and, and possibly some, you know, triple net leased investments or things of that nature uh, as this market matures. And everything you do is paperless, so if you wanted to... Now, is there like a sign-in code for this platform? Is there, uh, you know, is it secure? Is everything... Absolutely. So uh, that is one of the reasons why the tech people came in early, because there is a tech component where the SEC has pretty strict guidelines uh, about encryption and, and, you know, how you handle people's financial documents and right. things of that nature. Um, so there, you know, there is that component. But so you come in, um, you can go and you can kind of see Tombstone's basic information on mm -hmm. our offerings. But if you want to see the specific information, then you do need to register on our site. Okay. Um, and at that point, uh, once you registered, you can go in, review the different offerings. But we have all of the due diligence available on the site. Uh, the current appraisal, you know, financials and, and third-party reports, uh, but we also do have uh, the ability, you know, to sign the documents online, so you yeah. don't have to print it off, and you can electronically transfer the money into escrow um, if you'd like to invest in the offering. Now, Tim, you're from California. Does uh, your company services the whole U.S.? Yes, sir. Uh, that's uh, we we do uh, again specialize just in hotels, uh, but nationwide. And uh, we're kind of a rough rule of thumb, we'd like to stay closer to the top 25 metropolitan areas. Um, that's not a hard and fast rule, but um, you know, we certainly want to have an airport mm -hmm. somewhere close by. <laughs> so now if someone's interested and wants to get in touch with you, yes, how would they go about that? Well, um, 
you can go to Hotel Investor, I N N V E S T O R uh, dot com, and uh, that way, or certainly you can reach me at Tim at Hotel Investor, or, or you know, and our phone number's on the website as well. But we definitely encourage people to call. I think that that's kind of a misconception too, because it's a web-based portal. Right. So there's no phone number. Right. <laughs> it's just email. No, and, and that's not true. We really want to talk to our investors mm -hmm. because there is an issue about. Um, you know, the appropriateness of an investment, we, we don't want to get into a situation where we take money from someone, put them into a, a, a deal, and then they call us three months later like, oh, I need to get my money back right. because it doesn't right. work that way. So we, you know, are very diligent um, uh, about, you who know, you take on? who we take on, speaking to them. We have a very rigorous um, questionnaire involved in our subscription agreements to try and help determine appropriateness as well. Mm -hmm. um, and the other thing that I would say, and this is an important thing, is that um, we're a branch office of our broker dealer. Mm -hmm. So we are SEC and FINRA regulated, very heavily regulated. And to be an investor in one of our offerings, you need to be an accredited investor, which is an SEC definition, which is essentially a million dollar net worth, excluding your primary residence or have made 200,000 uh, a year for the last two years, or 300,000 uh, a year uh, as a couple um, in order to invest in these these projects. So it's not available uh, to everyone, okay? Right. Well, to me specifically, Rick looks like he's okay in that, in that, yeah. in that percentage <laughs> fraction. Well, we, we thank you for coming on, Tim. We do. We appreciate the information because uh, there are a lot of misconceptions about crowdfunding. Yes. And if someone wants to find out more, they can go to hotelinvestor.com. Uh, and, uh, and that's two N's in investor. That's two, right. two N's in investor. And again, please feel free to call me. We like to talk to people. So. You heard it here. Thank you, Tim. Thank you. Thank you. Our next guest is Rachel Rod Rodzinski. 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 <laughs> <laughs> they make me say it so many times that then when I go to put it on the ear, I, I do it wrong. Right. Uh, Rachel Rodzinski. Correct. And she was the moderator on the panel that was speaking about uh, for the Olympics. They're the panel on the Olympics. Right. And uh, some of the things that we've talked about quite frequently on our show are the 2024 Olympics. And what are, we're all for it, but what are some of the issues that are going to come up before and after? And you. You were telling me a few minutes ago yeah. about some of those issues that they have, some of the, the, the plans in place. Right, right. I think the issues that I heard about today were, well, there's political issues in anything that gets done in Boston. So there's been a lot of political comments, and now they're talking about having a referendum where you actually have to, we're going to vote on this, and not till 2017. So... One of the issues then is all the planning that they do, and then we vote. So it's not a definite yet. Um, transportation was also talked about today, mm -hmm. um, and we're all local here. Yep. So I asked the question, how do you handle transportation when there's a game at the Red Sox and you're trying to get people on the green line, and you also have to deal with these millions of people? And their comment to me was that part of the planning process will be to improve our current infrastructure, mm -hmm. tra current transportation. So that's all beneficial. Well, whether we have the Olympics or not, I uh, think that's an issue right. anyway. Yeah. I would also say it's a good problem to have. What? To Too many people in the area. It yeah. means it's have a lot to it do. Is, it's good but money. then it could become chaos as well. Of course. You know, if you have a problem with your transportation, your infrastructure has to be sufficient enough to handle this kind of traffic load. And I think that, yeah, I think that's a great question. We talked about that last week, Rick, you and I. I have a question about um, who does, all, there's so much work that goes up to even before the bid even happens or the vote. If we don't get the Olympics, who pays the bill for all the work that went into it? Sure. And again, I think somebody asked that question today, and I think the response was that it's all being pro funded privately. Okay. So um, there's a businesses in the area have already put together millions of dollars. I don't know the exact mm -hmm. number that's funding all of these studies and work. Um, the two folks that came to me today to speak, they came on their own. You know, they all work for other companies, mm -hmm. and they came today on their, you know, as direct directives from people within or their organization to participate and get the word out. Right. So I think that's all being from now until 
um, more decisions have been made. A lot of this is being p funded privately. Okay. But now some news. of the plans that they have in place, you, you were just telling me a few minutes ago about how they plan on building mm -hmm. and, and then using the structures they build yep. after the Olympics. Yep. Yeah, that's the so that's the legacy that they were talking about it today, and I I agree with what they've said, which is that they're going to try to use as much current infrastructure. For example, the stadiums at Harvard and mm -hmm. some of the schools that we have, um, the the commons for volleyball. Um, uh, another area where they're going to do archery at the uh, at MIT's campus. So they, they, they're trying to use the facilities and the grounds that we already have, mm -hmm. but then the major stadium that would, I think they said, account for 60,000 people would be a temporary stadium, the one okay. that we built in the South End. Mm -hmm. um, and so that they can then use the steel for something else um, so that they would that would be a build up for the event and then torn down. But the housing for the athletes would be housing that could then be converted to campus uh, housing for MIT, uh, for uh, UMass, mm -hmm. um, so that they could reuse it for another purpose. That's, that was my next question about housing. How do we, yeah. how do we accommodate all of, not only just the athletes themselves, but all the tourists that come with? Yeah. So that I can answer myself, right. I think. Now, <laughs> now in my space. Right, now, now, you're, that, right. now you're, you're a hotel... Uh, I do a hotel consulting, consult. and I do, I do a lot of work in Boston. So we did a lot of statistics that we gathered, that I presented today. Um, and so I, there, there's one issue that I brought up, and that is the, the peak time is July and August. Mm -hmm. And we are already, the entire greater Boston market, all the hotels from 495 in through Boston and Cambridge operate at about 83% occupancy. So we're already at a capacity issue. That's a very peak mm -hmm. season. Um, Wasn't well, it the only two good months to visit Boston? No, no, no. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> I mean, it's the only one that's it's, about 70. Yeah, it's, a, it's, it's the peak leisure season. Right? So we've yeah. got all that going on. Um, so where do we fit all these people? So there's a few ways to do it. One is new supply, and we project that there'll be 2% more rooms in 2024. Mm -hmm. um, the Olympic Committee says they, only, they say they only need 1% more mm -hmm. com combat. So we think there'll be more supply available that will be used. The other thing, we looked at um, other venues where the Olympics took place. Um, for example, in, um, I can't remember, I think it was Athens, um, there's two other venues we looked at. They actually came in with seven ships that could accommodate about another, uh, I don't think it was 40, 50,000 people. So the ships, and we have oh, the, we so have the ability to put in cruise ships. Like cruise ships. That's smart. So yeah. cruise ships is, 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 in my opinion, is a definite. We have the ability to bring cruise mm -hmm. ships here. Um, somebody else brought up uh, res uh, all the um, dorms. Right, right. Because that, that's, that's when the, the, the schools are closed. That's when my next question. So and you've got dorms and cruise ships, and you've got Airbnb and apartments and those kinds right, of things. Right, but what about, uh, by that time, the casino right. that's going to be opening in this area should be uh, completed, right. hopefully. Right. Uh, they do have the casino that will, will be completed in that MG MGM is building mm -hmm. in Springfield, is yep. it? Yeah. So that will be completed. Even though it's on the outskirts of the city, uh, people are going to be traveling all over Massachusetts, right. Right. as well as uh, most of New England. Sure. Yeah, Cape Cod. Yeah. You know, well, that's a, that's huge a New one. England, isn't it? Those are peak seasons, uh, <laughs> July and August down there yeah. as well. Yeah, that's uh, true. I happen to live on my way toward the Cape from here in Boston. Okay. Um, so I, I hate July and August um, yeah. for traffic reasons. But that would be good. That they should have the tunnel, to, the Cape Cod Tunnel <laughs> yeah, in by yeah, then, yeah, right? right? Um, <laughs> no, but so we, they're talking about how much uh, the infrastructure is going to change. If we do get the bid, does it then go into a private-public split? Th then it goes into a private-public split, yes. Then there'll be, there'll be, if we get selected, there'll be federal funding, mm -hmm. statewide funding, and then there'll be private entities that will be coming in to, to build some of these uh, new venues. So it'll be a combination. Mm -hmm. And I, you know, I'm not sure how far they've gotten on those kinds of plans, but I think that's right. how it works. Um, one thing I wanted to mention about lodging, um, which uh, they mentioned in my panel, which I wasn't aware of, um, if right now Jim Rooney, who heads up the BCEC, the convention center, right. he mentioned today that they're going to be actually not allowed to take books, bookings at the convention center during a six-month window in 2024. 
So, oh, that's being... so because that's where some of the events will take place. Yeah, right some of the, So that the corporate traveler and the group travel that currently will be staying in Boston isn't going to be staying in Boston that time frame. Right. So, so that, that accounts for a lot of lodging nights. So I guess that what he's trying to say is that if the Olympics do come to Boston, a lot of things that currently happen in Boston right. for lodging won't happen. I remember, you know, people will be here for the Olympics. So it's a... Well, that's yeah, a, a replacement. right. That, that's good and that's bad yeah. because the people that normally would book that convention center yeah. now are going to have to find a different venue right. somewhere else. Right. And soon, two twenty-five, right. they may not come back, yeah, and they might not come right. back. Yeah, so. I mean, that, and he was saying that you know, it's we've got to give up something to. Of course. For, for everybody's going to have to give up something to get the, to get this event here. Especially time if they have to change all the infrastructure in and around the city. Yeah. Well, you know, Route and I, three but in you know, 93 are already abysmal already. <laughs> trying to get into. You know, but my whole feeling is the big dig took how long? Ten years? I think it was like 38. <laughs> <laughs> it felt like <laughs> it, it was, was my whole It life. was too long. It, was yeah, too it long. took long ten time. years, and it was outdated five years before it was done. <laughs> right, right. So, so I mean, that's how do you a, how do you build an infrastructure in that short a period of time? Well, you traffic. know what the great thing is, is the Olympics is a great motivator for that. Money. Yeah. Money's a great motivator. It does get people up and pushing, especially if they know they have a deadline. Hey, we need to be ready for how many millions of people are going to be coming Well, here. I think if that also, if the private sector mm -hmm. is the people pushing in charge it. of the infrastructure. Maybe. I think well, that might so get it done quicker. When you, when you do your job, which is, you said that you're... The lodging data. We do a lot. We do consulting for the hotel industry, and we yep. collect. We collect and evaluate lodging data. Yes. Right. And, and is that just on occupancy per hotel, or do you get all the way down, fine tuned down to the all the way consumer? down to all the way down to what kind of hotel should somebody build or buy, mm -hmm. and is it feasible? So we look at the cost to build it, and we look at the feasibility of it. So. Nice. So, for example, with the Olympics does come to Boston, there'll be a lot of cl people calling us to say, should we build a hotel? And right. where should we build it and what kind? Um, nice. And we're going to say, in don't, build it, don't yeah. build it for one, you know, for one event. Yeah. Yeah. And come down from 289 yeah. and go all the way around through Vermont. Right. Yeah, uh, yeah. That's great stuff. And what is the name of the company that you actually work for? Pinnacle Advisor Group. That's okay. my company. Oh, I've heard of them. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> nice. Good I just wanted to make sure. So our okay. That's right. Know, okay. So I wanted and, to talk to you about. Right. Uh, and that was Rachel Rodzinski. Rodzinski. You got and it. She is, was the moderator on the Olympic uh, panel. panel this afternoon or this right. morning. We appreciate you coming on, Rachel. Great. Thank you very much. Thanks Thank for having much. me. Thank you. Thank you. And that was Tim Edgar of Hotel Investor and Rachel Rajinsky of Pinnacle Advisor, and she is also the moderator for the Olympics Committee at the HELP Conference. And we'll be right back on Money Matters Radio Network. The next level in commercial real estate. This is New England Real Estate Radio on the Money Matters Radio Network and online at moneymattersboston.com. Listen, are you living in a condo or co-op? Do you have difficulty receiving deliveries from UPS, FedEx, or your pharmacy when you're not home? Well, there's a solution. Video Doorman. It's a security system with live on-call operators for condos and co-ops that receives packages when you're out, stores them in a safe package room, and then notifies you about your delivery. They can even handle dry cleaning, pickup, and delivery. But there's more. If you come home late at night and don't feel safe, just press the Video Doorman key fob, and the Video Doorman operator will greet you by name and escort you right up to your floor. He can see you and speak to you and handle any potential problem. And Video Doorman costs only about a dollar a day. Call Video Doorman at 888-697-3630 or visit VideoDoorman.com to receive a free building evaluation. That number again is 888-697-3630. Call now, feel safer, and never miss a delivery again. Rick Kaplan on the Money Matters Radio Network and online at MoneyMattersBoston.com. And we're back on New England Real Estate Journal Radio. I'm Rick Kaplan with Eric Wilson, and we have I have sitting right next to me is Jim O'Connell from O'Connell Hospitality Group, and I also have Matt Labar. He's the director of development for Marriott. Yes. One question, Jim. You run the Help Conference. How easy was it this year getting everybody out? Were you nervous about the blizzards and the snow possibly still being here? <laughs> yeah, the, bl the blizzards were. Well, actually, 
the first day of spring was yesterday. Yeah. We, had, we had fantastic time, uh, weather for the for the oh, event. It was really out. terrific. Yeah, nice. opening day, opening right. salvo for us was terrific. And the dine-out, I'm sure, was awesome, as always. dine rounds were, were full. <laughs> uh, and, uh, yeah, this morning everyone had some bleary eyes, so everything worked out well. Perfect. Yeah, if anyone has not been to the HELP conference, uh, they, they should plan on it for next year. <laughs> <laughs> we, we, this year is um, what's making waves. And what we decided to do, besides your traditional investment conference, you know, rates and terms and things, um, we decided to hit on what's changing the industry. Things are moving so fast that um, uh, we wanted to make, we wanted to enlighten people on how their, the value of their properties was being affected by things that they may or may not even know. Um, TripAdvisor and uh, small companies like TripBam uh, are, are taking hold of the industry so that's that's what we wanted to do is highlight things that are making waves so some what are some unknown of the unknowns if you will <laughs> for the I've lunch heard that yeah it was at the lunch uh, <laughs> keynote speaker that was one of her uh one of her google, points. a good example google right. uh to have them they will definitely impact the travel industry and the hospitality industry mm. and and so yeah so we wanted to have someone like that there trip advisor um and this trip bam as an example, um, as a platform where if you booked a room 30 days out for $200 and, and you, you had TripBam, if the hotel decided to sell rooms for uh, cheaper, $150 or whatever between the time you reserved and the time you came, it would automatically reset. It would automatically cancel your $200 room and book you at the $150 all the way until you started so wow. it's a tremendous impact on on the uh, on the ownership and on the values mm -hmm. what were some of the other topics that were talked about during the conference well, I turn it over to Matt with brands because I think uh, the, the, the branding is a, is a big issue well I've actually you know I've, I've been with Marriott for a couple of years now and, and I want to thank Jim sincerely for, for letting Marriott participate here in the conference and uh, Marriott is one of the uh, you know, biggest hotel companies in the world, and, and I'm very blessed to sell um, such fantastic brands. And it's, it's a great time to be uh, in the industry, and especially with uh, with Marriott Corporation. We've we've recently announced two new uh, lifestyle brands. We've we've done a lot of research recently on that next generation traveler, the millennial traveler, um, you know, the, the younger generation. You know, where are they staying? What kind of consumer they are? And we, we've developed these really cool and chic, edgy brands that are a little bit outside of our, our traditional box, per se. Um, I think, you know, most people in the industry in hotel real estate are familiar with our, our traditional brands, Courtyard and, and Residence Inn and Fairfield Inn and Suites. Um, now we have a new brand called AC, which is more of a, you know, lifestyle boutique uh, focused service brand, and we also have a um, essentially a micropod uh, guest room product called Moxie that we recently announced uh, this year. <laughs> Moxie, and I like that name. At, uh, so Moxie, you know, some some say that the acronym stand for Motel of Generation X and Y and Millennials, mm. and so it's really focused on that next generation traveler. You see, from my era, it meant something different. <laughs> was, you drank it. But, oh, yeah. I, I thought you carried yourself with it. <laughs> right? Isn't that Moxie? Yeah. <laughs> well, I have a question about the Google part. What do you think? Did you think Google, because they have the search engine optimization, and we all type in Google, say, I need hotel near whatever. That's how usually I book hotels. Um, do you think that because second page results don't have a lot, that's going to totally affect the brands that are on the first page? And those that like aren't on the first page are gonna, who knows, in the future. You take that. Well, the thing about you know Marriott and, and Hilton and, and Starwood and, and Choice is that um, you know our our loyalty, our rewards mm -hmm. memberships are are so significant, and you know I, I think it's it's very difficult to, to penetrate that level of, of loyalty mm -hmm. um, that we have within our, our systems. 
and the, in the product, the consistency that you you understand you have as a as a consumer and as a as a hotelier and someone who mm-hmm. travels, you know you're going to get when you're staying at a you know your particular and your mm-hmm. loyal brand. Um, in light of the fact that there's all these new um, avenues and ways to, to book hotel rooms and mm-hmm. there's you know there's all kinds of rate wars but the thing is is that you know you know what you're going to get when you're staying at a at a Marriott branded property or right. Hilton branded property you know so I was thinking, the reason I'm sorry I know you want to jump in there I was gonna say uh, but with Millennials and our new generation including myself we don't branding is a lot different we're ready to switch that's one thing with Millennials it, it's all about are you now? Are you in my face? Does my friend have a picture from your hotel room? Did he look like he had a great time? Because that's what I want. And those type of things where you have all these different avenues to get your brand across, do you think that changed the landscape at all? Or is it, is it just the same way it was 10 years ago because of it? Well, I, I believe that's really why we've recently announced these two new lifestyle right. brands is to, is to capture that that niche um, and supposedly there's a there's a billion dollars worth of hotel rates right. uh, in the market with the next generation traveler right and so we've spent you know significant capital to, to understand the next generation traveler to create a product that will resonate with the you know the 20 to 30 year old traveler something that's cool different right. you know it's not your your father it's not your baby boomer right hotel it's it's something that's what we believe is going to be a, a, a game changer and, and and from the investment community right you know everyone's truly excited about you know these really new happening brands and we feel that the product is, is, is something so outside the traditional box that the, the, the millennial traveler who's who wants something that's different and that's cool? It's, it's, right. it's going to make sense of this. Cool. Now, Matt, on that, you said that micro was a micro pod. Uh, yes. Yeah. Yes. So, what kind of traveler uses that type of a hotel? Is it for millennials? Or? Yes, it's the the millennials really only use the the hotel guest room to sleep. You know, most mm-hmm. of, you know the, the, all the time that you spend in your hotel, uh, especially in a, in an urban environment, your eyes are closed. You know, you want to be out in the city. You want to engage. Uh, the hotels um, in, in major cities such as Boston in New York City really live in the public space. Mm-hmm. So you're going to be engaging. You're going to be hanging out at the bar. You're going to be getting drinks. And so, you know, the, the guest room is really a place to, to put your bag. So what would the guest room consist of? Is it just going to be a, like a bed squeezed in between two walls? Not necessarily <laughs> just a, you know... Some would say military, you know, the bare essentials. Nice, uh, but it's a, it's a, it's a, it's a, it's My a cozy, style. cozy, yeah. efficient, cozy. efficient bedroom. Like <laughs> cozy, you know, and and there's a, actually a number of new micro pod hotel guest rooms, mm-hmm. in, uh, especially in Europe and in Asia. Um, and there's been a couple that have been built in in New York, and they've been tremendously successful. I, I have been in a, well. It, they call it, I don't know what they call it in, in uh, Asia, but I have been in a jail. Oh. <laughs> <laughs> I have been in a hotel that is like here, a Rick. micro <laughs> hotel where it's just the bed and the the bathroom was very minimal as well. You know, What was your, what was your experience with it? Well, you know, I, like you were saying, I wasn't, I was only there to sleep. Right. You know, and the next morning I was up and out. So I wasn't it spending a lot of time in the room, so it was it was comfortable enough, you know. Get a good night's rest, take a shower, and you're off. That's I all I weird, needed. I have a weird question. Um, with this new generation, I probably could have summed it. It's the selfie generation. Is the lighting different, or is the decor different in the room to help people enhance their own pictures? Because that's what they also do in their room. They get, before they go out at night, they like to take the quick selfie. We're here. We're going to go tear up New York City. Um, does the lighting or anything, did you even think about accommodating to that? Certainly, hmm. and, and part of the prototypical design of these new lifestyle brands is to incorporate uh, you know, a DJ in the, in right. the public nice. space to really get people fired up and mm-hmm. to enjoy their experience. And, and, and I, I can't say enough that you know these new boutique lifestyle hotels really live in the public space. Awesome. People are gonna be hanging out, engaging, you know, no one wants to spend time in their in their hotel rooms anymore, especially in in urban areas such right. as Boston and New York. You know, people are going to go to the Red Sox game and come back. They're right. going to hang out in the, in the lobby. They're going to engage. And they they want to take pictures and meet of new course. people. And, and it, 
it's right. certainly well that was one of the experiences when i was when i stayed in a hotel like that you know the micro type of hotel the lobby was you go there and that's where a lot of people would be hanging out most of the time mm. if they were staying in the hotel it's almost you know, like a the, living room right kind of right idea the the and certainly not in the millennial generation, but you look it. <laughs> but the but the interesting thing of the the development of the hotel industry as a as a branded product, starting with Holiday Inns along the um, along the interstate highways when the interstate highway system was constructed in, in the fifties and the sixties, and it got to a the the, the primary success was driven by consistency that you'd get in your car you'd stay in a holiday inn in in somerville and you could drive to schenectady and stay in effectively the same type of property right. and everything was the same and, and right. so you knew it similar to a mcdonald's as an example you knew what to expect well now the millennial generation doesn't want a, it would be consistent in cleanliness and things like mm -hmm. that, but they want an experience. They want a different experience. If it's Schenectady, whatever is in Schenectady, they want to experience it. Right. So it's different. It's moving away from cons consistent brand, the same, the same, the same, right. because this generation doesn't want the same. They want something different every time they travel. Right. So, and that is how that actually translates into corporate on the corporate side, the corporate transient mm -hmm. traveler, um, and how, the, how they evolve is still, uh, right. we're gonna be a couple of cycles away from figuring that one out. We'll but, be talking about this in yeah, years yeah, from now yeah. at yeah. Health Conference 2022. Yeah. Yeah. <laughs> so like every uh, other business, uh, it takes is, time. they evolve and you know, make it, their adjustments to the type of clients that are out there. Which well, the construction costs and things are, as a micropod, um, 148 square foot room. 160. 160 square feet. The average, the average hotel room is 320 square feet. So this is half of a guest room, including now, the bathroom. Now, with America's big issue, when I use that big as the pun, um, obesity, what about, how does that play any kind of effect? And that's serious. I mean, we're a huge country. We like, we you know what Asia and Europe. I just ate. Geez. Yeah, like, we you know what Asia and that's Europe. That's called the sweet. Oh, no. You know, they're smaller people than we are here in America. So, do you think know, that was it's, kind of a it's, turn -off? It's, I would think no. it's like anything else. You know, if you're going on an airline, their seats are only designed for a certain size so, person. Right so. now. The, the um, no, it's a, uh, it's completely, it, it's, I don't know if it's completely, because a lot of this is evolving, mm -hmm. so, and it takes years to affect a change. So, um, it, it's, it's not the size, it's, the, it's what the guest wants to experience. Mm -hmm. and, um, and, and it's, it, that's why a Marriott and all, all the other major brands are involved in lifestyle brands. Right. Um, because the generations that stayed in a courtyard or stayed in in something that is consistent across them and the those they were afraid of losing this whole generation of people because right. that's not what they they're looking for they're looking for an experience so we'll nice. still have there are some old it's it's Why there are some old me? courtyards <laughs> no no I'm, you can still have a courtyard right yeah. it's some old hampton inns you know as yeah. as the as the evolution of this business um, and Unfortunately, because uh, IHG has been a big supporter of our brand, and no, no disrespect, but the Holiday Inns, these other brands, the Marriotts, the Hiltons of the world, all watched IHG dissolve the the quality of the hotels. They it got old in front of them, and they did nothing to to to, to uh, adapt mm -hmm. and they became irrelevant they dropped down the ladder where they were the king they dropped down the ladder so that's the last thing that these brands want to want to do mm -hmm. so it's it's uh it's, it's very interesting to watch so it is a uh, it's in process it's in process <laughs> and these things continue to to evolve but from a from a transaction standpoint uh, a lot of developers and, and investors and, and banks are, are so excited about these new uh, not necessarily micropod, but very cozy 
guest room product because they can get so many more keys into the building. Mm. And if you look at the, the transactions and the, the real estate sales that have happened on the hotel side here in Boston and in, in New York City, you know, guest rooms can sell at a per key cost of, of over $600,000 per key. Right. So if you can get a couple more keys in with a, with a cozy guest room, that's a, a huge, huge value to add to the yeah, project. A, I consider that, I call it the divorce theory. You know, I go from a 3,000 square foot home to a 160 square foot uh, room. <laughs> but, uh, but I appreciate you guys coming on. Uh, this is Jim O'Connell. He's from uh, O'Connell Hospitality Group. And we have Matt Labar mm -hmm. in his business development for the Marriott. Business development, right? Yep. 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 I appreciate you coming on. Thank you very much. Thank you Thanks for having so us. For Thank you very much. Thanks for some of our All questions. Right, guys. Good stuff. Our next guest, it's Ken Ford and Hans Wentrup of New England Hotel Realty. That's right? correct. Is that right? And uh, so how's hotels uh, selling right now? Well, the market's picked up quite a bit. Um, you know, we have uh, a pipeline of properties that we're doing opinion to value on that's quite long. Um, we have a several new listings and we'll uh, we'll take several more in, in the next few months I think maybe as many as a dozen more but um, the market's very active um, the buying activity is very active uh, the lending community is very active and um, interest rates are great and most sellers have had a couple years of improvement here in a row so values are up and it's a great time to sell but it's also a great time to be a buyer well, that's why we, you brought on Hans. That's true. You know, we, we, he's we the newest of your family. Now we have more hands to to make the pie bigger, and uh, we're really pleased with Hans. And um, we recruited him over a course of several months, and uh, we think we got the right person. Ken, how is there a, is there a particular season that is like uh, big interest for hotels throughout the year, like there is any kind of other real estate, or is it whenever there's a need? And that's it. You do have some seasonality um, uh, to reflect a little bit, and maybe to make a broad statement. Is most hotels in New England have a seasonality period where you have a high high mm -hmm. uh, of performance, and particularly in the in the middle of the summer, mm -hmm. and you have a low low in the in the dead of the winter, and everything in between kind of fluctuates. So in terms of buying, now is a time where people are either have properties under contract or want to put them under contract so that they can close in the most fruitful cash flow season. Mm -hmm. um, but in many institutional buyers will buy at any time of the year um, and look at it um, a little bit differently. You know, you may have a repositioning opportunity where a buyer will want to close in October at the end of the year so that they can shut the hotel down and renovate it completely. Mm -hmm. So there's there's really a couple ways to look at it. So now you, I, I hear this all the time that you go into a, like, the city of Boston that they are lacking hotel rooms. So there's a need for more hotels, obviously. A little bit, it's, yeah, a little bit of a build it and they will come right. mentality. So, so in that situation, would you go out and try to find a, a buyer to build a hotel? Do you find the land for them, a, a location? We generally don't focus on land. It has a much longer lead time from listing that property for sale until you actually have a closing on the land because you have permits, you have approvals that need to take place, and those can you can get clogged up. Um, for a couple of years doing that. So we generally try and focus on existing facilities that are open and operating in terms of selling. But we've done land deals and, you know, you could probably make a good living doing land deals today because development is picking up. Plus you have a shortage of land, a space, or especially around here. Especially in New England. Yeah. You know, it's, it's, a, it's uh, there aren't a lot of great locations left to choose from, but... Um, in places that there are, they go for a premium. I'm going to throw a curveball here. What do you think about uh, with the Olympics coming in and the influx of hotel demand and need? Is that a good thing for someone uh, of yourself, uh, a boutique real uh, deal um, brokerage? Or is this something that you think is against you? Well, um, I'd say all in all, we still have 
probably more hotel rooms that are older rather than newer. Mm -hmm. So that would be a positive thing. Um, with the Olymp you know, the, the potential of the Olympics coming, I think that's going to get spread out into the suburbs mm -hmm. quite a bit as well um, so that the city is not bearing all that responsibility. But, you know, more new hotels is, it, it is good. The long-term vision being really having newer hotels that have today's standards in them and are really are what the customers want mm -hmm. you know so the more we get the better off we'll be long term but some people will suffer in the meantime right <laughs> well i i gotta well, think that you this two-part question yes it is a two-part <laughs> question i have to think that uh you have a lot of people that are interested in selling because of the Olympics. That's what I was going to say. You have a and, you might ha and you'll have nine quite a few interested in buying because it might be a good time for both. Selling and buying is good right now. Um, and the, Olymp the Olympics is well... Nine years far away. Yeah, it's far away. I, you know, I, I wonder how well Boston will compete globally to, to get the Olympic bid. But... Um, no, it's it's possible. It's certainly possible. So, you you brought on Hans, and we've known Hans for quite a few years. Uh, so, oh. how's things going with you, Hans? <laughs> you know, how how are you liking the the hotel business? Oh, it's great. Uh, you know, I've been working with Ken, I think, almost uh, a month now, and uh, you know, I'm going to be responsible for the New England market. And uh, I'm looking forward to, uh, to getting on board and, and getting my feet wet and getting settled in and, and uh, getting some deals under my belt. How's been the transition uh, from former employer to new? Uh, everything good? Uh, now? Very smooth transition. Uh, nice. Ken's been great and uh, it's a great organization to be part of and uh, I'm looking forward to making an impact. Nice. Well, we wish you good luck, Hans. He sounds like a number one draft much. pick. <laughs> yeah, <laughs> right. Right. For the Patriots. That's right. That would make a huge impact. I just want to be part of the team. I'll fit in wherever my role is. We traded up to get him. Yeah, right? <laughs> and was, we were speaking with Ken Ford and Hans Wentrup of New England Hotel. Will we see you guys next Realty. week, by the way? Sorry to interrupt. We, who yes. you're, you're we will be at Cocktails and Conversations nice. in Portsmouth. Yes. And so you, you guys can, can see them at April 23rd as that's well. That's right, at uh, Cocktails and Conversations in Portsmouth, New, New Hampshire. Yeah. And we'll be right back on Money Matters Radio Network. Kaplan is right here on the Money Matters Radio Network. And we're back on New England Real Estate Journal Radio. I'm Rick Kaplan with Eric Wilson, and we're coming to the close of our show at the HELP Conference at the Seaport Hotel in Boston. Another great show. And it has been event. a lot of information some good information. Some really good information. We talked a lot about the Olympics, and we talked a lot about software and, and, uh, and where they're going. I really liked it. Yes, you know, the, it's it's funny because the this is our third year doing this, it is. and you can see some of the, the evolution to the hotel right. industry. <laughs> you know, I know our first year was very uh, handshake and very old school, traditional. True. And uh, this year, you know, they're talking about all the disruptors and who's coming in and who's helping to evolve the game. Right, and I think it's like, really cool. like Matt Labar from right. uh, Marriott, he was talking about you know how they're evolving in just their own their, their rooms yeah. and, their, their, and how they're catering to millennials, millenniums. Right. You know, so I mean that's a. Uh, it was really cool. It was really yeah. interesting to see that. Thing. And then the Olympics. Yeah, that's uh, that's a big topic. It's with gonna, us. We'll be talking about the Olympics for the next nine years, but uh, but uh, you know that was that was good that she came on. She to told us a little bit about what is the overall what thoughts, they were talking what, about. Yeah, exactly. And Concerns you know, and things like that. It, we we can get a little more information out to the general public mm -hmm. on what's really going on with the the right. Olympics. 2024. Yeah, it was a great show, and I and I, I hope you guys enjoyed it as well as we did. It's always great to interview these uh, attendees and as well as those who speak. And uh, I'm just always thankful that Jim O'Connell from O'Connell Hospitality, who joined us earlier, invites us every year. Yeah, and also, got to say the the Seaport Hotel, they always do a nice job here. Great as well. for us, they do a great job. So I, we appreciate them. Yeah, hopefully they appreciate us after I, we. We I moved so their whole too. place around here. But, but uh, we have some events coming up. We want to give one last shout-out to everybody before uh, we take off. Uh, next week, April 23rd, join us in Portsmouth, New Hampshire for the Cocktails and Conversations event um, at the Harborside uh, uh, Event Center, uh, as well as, I know, Building Impact. Uh, most of you guys won't have the opportunity. We'll tell you about it next week because we'll be going tomorrow night. Um, what else do we have? June 4th, the Connecticut Business Expo. Yeah. 
uh, put on by the Hartford Business Journal. Uh, we'll be doing our radio show live from there, NEBFM, uh, a little bit later in June, June 18th. Uh, we'll be doing our show from there. And following, uh, save the date for uh, June 24th, Cocktails and Conversations down in Rhode Island. And I also want to remind everyone that if they want to contact us, they can always contact us at radio at com. They can tweet us at Ricky Cap or EP underscore Wilson. Wilson. Yep. Or you can just find us on LinkedIn. Or NERJ Radio on or, Twitter. You can go right there. We both monitor that. Yeah. Uh, you can go right to our radio page on our website, NERJ Radio forward slash radio. Yeah. No, NERJ.com forward, forward slash, slash radio. radio. It's all right. You'll, get, you'll, be, you'll be a millennial one of these days. <laughs> yeah, millennial. <laughs> I'm going backwards. I'm not going yeah. forward. Like ben Benjamin Button. <laughs> and I think, Eric. What's that, this Rick? Deal is done. <laughs>